It is the unconscious feeling of insecurity that produces most of our anxieties, those vague feelings that things are not right, that make the future look dark and gloomy and rob the present of its happiness. Anxiety disappears as faith enters, just as light dissipates darkness. And so what's so amazing is that ultimately this is the message of the winter solstice. Do you see, no matter how dark it is, the light returns. I'd like to do a, uh, a song by Jan and J.D., Jan Garrett and J.D. Martin. They're New Thought uh, singer-songwriters, and this is a song called Solstice Song. And as we move into our conversation about principle, of course, we're starting with uh, winter solstice, the time of the turning of the seasons, the turning of the year. And um, yeah, you know, I was interested in uh, having this conversation with a couple people over the last week or so about one of the really amazingly beautiful parts of the holidays, and certainly for me, um, is the ritual turning of the year that happens. Every year, 
Um, we have parties, we either have a tree or we have some sort of decoration or maybe we go back to visit our families and, and there's sort of the rhythm of the year. And I don't know what your photo albums look like, but my photo albums look like last Christmas there was a Christmas tree and some parties and the year before that there was a Christmas tree and some parties and the year before that there was a Christmas tree and some parties, right? And, and, and there's something really... Um, I don't know, for me, there's something really anchoring about that. And while sometimes like, oh, here we go, the holidays again, you know, there's also that very ritual return of the year. We come to the end of the year, we have an opportunity to, you know, think about what the year's been about. And we see um, new, fra new faces around our tables, um, maybe some faces that are no longer there, Certainly our children grow older, um, and, and there's something about that that I find very um, meaningful at this time of year, and something I invite us to really reflect on as the winter solstice brings us this turning of the season. And of course, that's what we're celebrating in winter solstice. It's that moment that's marked um, where we have um, the longest night and the shortest day in the Northern Hemisphere. And so we've, we've marked a moment in the turning of the seasons. And, and this process just goes on every year. Every year there's this cycle of life. And, and we can, well, in our culture today, and yeah, sometimes even in the science of mind and our, our race to improve ourselves, it feels like we, are, we, we're, we always have the go button on, doesn't it? It feels like it's always pedal to the metal. You gotta, you gotta keep manifesting things, you gotta keep improving, you gotta, you know, you wanna have a new life and you wanna make a little more money and you wanna do something a little more and a little more and a little more and, and certainly, um, yeah. Certainly, I've found myself sometimes feeling like that's the only, it's, the, it's really the only um, um, speed I have is go or sleep, <laughs> right? And, and this, this cycle of life, this turning of life into winter reminds us that there's actually a time to take the foot off the brake, uh, the foot off the, the gas pedal. There's actually time to take foot off the gas pedal and maybe even to put our foot on the brake. When we come to winter, that fallow time, we got into our gardens and everything has died back and the leaves have dropped from the trees and, and there's a quiet to it. Winter solstice invites us to listen to that, to, to allow ourselves to not always be always on full on. And I think it's so profound to be reminded of this. Winter solstice, of course, comes from our pagan traditions, our indigenous traditions, those traditions where, where people live a little closer to the earth. And so where we actually feel those seasons and cycles. I mean, I don't know about you, but in the summer, I go from air-conditioned house to air-conditioned car to air-conditioned work. And in the winter, I go from heated house to heated car to heated work, and if it's not 72 degrees, I'm like, what is the matter out there, right? We have forever conversations about the weather because the weather's not perfect. And we've gotten used to it being controlled, haven't we? Climate control, and even our lights. We can get up at any time in the morning we want, we can go to bed at any time at night we want, and we're completely, well, we can be completely disassociated with this natural rhythm of life. That there is a time to push, to grow, to flourish. There's a time to harvest. And then there's a time to turn within. And, and the winter solstice reminds us of this quiet moment, this moment. And, and I notice that not only do we not have a tendency to go to that place? I think sometimes we're so used to being on go 
that when we're not on go, it feels like there's something wrong, doesn't it? Yeah. And so we've, we've made that sort of winter fallow quiet time, we've sort, of, we've sort of made it not okay. It's not okay to not be going for something right this very moment. And yet again, in winter, there's an opportunity for some quiet and some fallow time. And there's actually something going on in the background, maybe, in consciousness, just like there's something going on under the soil as the roots are digging ever deeper into the ground. The other thing that's really interesting about winter solstice, of course, is that in the way it's often presented um, and the way this idea of winter and darkness is presented to us is that it's something to be overcome, that light and dark are forever battling with each other. Uh, Yeah, came out, what, this week? Star Wars, right? Classic hero's journey, the classic example, light and dark contending with each other. And, and, and it's, you're on the edge of your seat to see what's going to happen. Who's going to win? And so we come to this natural season, this natural cycle of light and dark, and we've taken it up as a contest or as a place of, um, yeah, of, of contention, of battle. And yet when we think about this light and dark, do you see light and dark are simply the pairs of opposites the Hindus talk about that are part of living in a manifested universe in the space-time continuum. Light and dark are two sides of the pairs of opposites that allow creation to happen. Light and dark, up and down, hot and cold, in and out. These are the pairs of opposites Just like we talked about earlier this month, um, two weeks ago, about space and time. The the pair that go together to, to allow this beautiful thing we call creation to happen. We most commonly see this idea in the yin yang symbol. The yin yang symbol, this beautiful image, has, well, unfortunately, often been popularly depicted as this battle between light and dark. And yet, that's not what it represents at all. If you really take a look at the yin-yang symbol, you'll notice that it is actually in movement all of the time. The white is moving into the dark, is into the black. The black is moving into the white. And it actually represents this constant movement. Light moves into day, day moves back into light, into night. Summer moves into winter, winter moves back into summer. And that this is a, a dynamic process that's going on all of the time. And there's a purpose and a reason why the white spot, the white circle is in the black and the black circle is in the white because it's representing that these two things are intimately connected and are actually moving into each other as opposed to being static, as opposed to being in opposition. In Chinese philosophy, yin and yang describe how seemingly opposite or contrary forces may actually be complementary, interconnected, and interdependent in the natural world, and how they give rise to each other as they interrelate with one another. They give rise to each other. That's represented by the white circle on the black field. The white is, being, is given rise and becomes then that whole white piece, and then the black emerges again. So it's interesting. I've always seen yin-yang as yin one thing, yang another thing. But in all of this research that I've been doing, what's really fascinating is in the traditional Chinese, yin-yang is one word. It's written as one word. Not yin and yang, but yin-yang. In none of these conceptions of yin-yang is there a valuation hierarchy as if yin could be abstracted from yang 
or vice versa, or regarded as superior, or considered metaphysically separated and distinct. Instead, yin-yang is emblematic of valuation equality, rooted in the unified, dynamic, and harmonized structure of the cosmos. Sort of like you can't have one without the other, because they are constantly moving as the seasons and cycles change and shift. Therefore, yin and yang are the starting point of change. When something is whole, by definition, it is unchanging and complete. So when you split something into two halves, yin, yang, it upsets the equilibrium of wholeness. This starts both halves chasing after each other as they seek a new balance with each other. So this interrelatedness is the very heart of change itself the very heart of movement, of that cyclical movement. And, and as we talked last week about essence and about the presence of life itself as that wholeness, as that eternal reality, do you see that spiritual reality is static? And as we spoke about in the first week of this month of oneness, spirit moving into matter, the moment that life winks into existence of matter, it is no longer static. It is the dynamic process of life unfolding, of growth and change. We don't always like that part, do we? I've manifested my perfect job. This is going to be my job for my rest of my life. I've manifested the perfect home, the perfect this, the perfect that. And then we want it to be static. We want it to be, we want to box it, put a little box and say, okay, I've done it now. Oh, oh, wait, wait, oh, wait. And then we have the season and the cycle of life of this, well, we don't like the word much in science of mind. We have this apparent duality. What the Hindus call the pairs of opposites, this apparent duality. The duality which might be called the pendulum swing. It's also the continuum that we talked about on the first Sunday of spirit and matter, an apparent duality. So I found this fabulous website which I bookmarked because it's really amazing. It's called Plotinus.com. And on Plotinus.com, there was this reflection on duality. Duality actually makes us conscious beings, tying and binding the concrete and abstract parts of our thought processes and intuition. It is apparent also that through duality, we can learn to harmonize our unmanifested essence with our incarnated body. To harmonize the spiritual truth of who we are with our expression here in the manifest world. Hence, it is clear that both need each other to manifest the light of consciousness here on earth. It's challenging if one is a disembodied spirit, a light floating around in the universe, to actually be that light here in the world when we most need it. Do you see? Without manifestation, without incarnation, that light, that light can't be contributed to the world. Thus, we can conclude that on an individual level of consciousness, our physical body is the cup that receives and manifests the unmanifested spirit. And that through their blending and harmonization, duality dissolves into unity and wholeness. We can further say that duality governs creation and nature since it is only through its action and workings that we are led to the unmanifested center of pure being. You see, it's in the very 
experience of these cycles and seasons and the continuity that runs through them that piques our curiosity, that invites us into, well, what is that thread of wholeness within this constant wheel of change? And without the cup into which spirit can be poured, into which the essential nature of who we are can be poured, without the cup, there is no light in the world. And so this seeming duality becomes something very real and important to us. For those of you who are ready to take classes next year, if you've taken foundations, we talk a great deal about this in the Bible Old Testament when we wrestle with the story of the Garden of Eden. And this apparent duality that seems fundamental not only to to this experience, but fundamental to the way that the essential wholeness is revealing itself. The living spirit is being made manifest. So, The first week we talked about oneness, right? It's all one. There's a wholeness. It's all one. And the second week, last week, we talked about presence, the essence of this light as the life that is indwelling us and all of creation. And it is so interesting when we think about the winter solstice, the most common symbol that I saw for the winter solstice is this symbol of the lighted tree, a tree of light, this essential reality being poured forth into manifest form. The winter solstice isn't just about the darkness or about contending with the darkness. It is about bringing forth the light, but not in opposition. Ernest Holmes calls this the twin pillars of our teaching. This then is our teaching, love and law. Love is the impulse, law makes the way possible. Love is the presence, the personal experience of the divine. Law is the impersonal process of creation. This then is our teaching. Like yin and yang, inseparable, he goes on to say this, it is, the basis, it is basic to our philosophy that we are surrounded by an infinite presence and that we are also surrounded by an infinite principle. And we never mistake the principle for the presence or the presence for the principle. <clears throat> he goes on to say this, the basic proposition is that the universe in which we live is a combination of love and law or divine presence, which we spoke about last week, and universal principle. We may call it a spontaneous self-emergence and a mechanical reaction, or the word and the law, or the personal and the impersonal, or the thing itself and the way it works. Everything we do say and teach (coughs) Our methods of treatment and procedures all are based not on a duality, but on a dual unity or a two-sided unity of one and the same thing. A two-sided unity, one and the same thing. We live in a universe of love as well as a universe of law. One is the complement of the other. The universe of love pulsating with feeling, with emotion, and the universe of law, the executor of all feeling and all emotion. Do you see this dual unity, this apparent duality is, well, we can start with the law of cause and the laws of the um, pairs of opposites, But ultimately, where we're going is the law of cause and effect. This 
This beautiful representation of the tree also reminds us that, where, oh, I don't want that quote quite yet, hang on. This beautiful representation of the tree reminds us that this principle that we're talking about is the law of cause and effect. It's not just the pairs of opposites here in the physical reality, but the ultimate dual unity is cause and effect. As above, so below. Cause and effect. That in the cause, inherent in the seed, is the manifestation. A dual unity. And we can't have one without the other. Albert Camus, he says this, In the midst of winter, I found that there was within me an invincible summer. In the midst of winter, I found that there was within me an invincible summer. This invincible summer is the essential reality in the midst of winter, which may be the outpicturing, the cycle, the season that we're in. And this, in, and this, oops, hang on, and this invincible summer is the essential reality, the truth of who we are. So Ernest Holmes says, all is love, and yet all is law. Love rules through law. Love is the divine givingness. Law is the way. Love is spontaneous. Law is impersonal. And do you see what we sometimes do, and this is what the winter solstice reminds us, what we sometimes do is we look at this cause and effect, and we look at the effect, and we take it personally. Well, I didn't expect it to be this cold outside. I don't really care for a winter and cold. Ugh, what a horrible thing. We take, do you see? We take it personally. I don't like the dark. I don't like the negativity. I don't like the depression. I don't like the whatever it is. I don't like one side. I only want the other. And yet winter is not personal. It didn't say it was going to be cold today just to annoy you. Really. And yet, we are annoyed, are we not? Well, some of, us, we, some of us really love it, and that's okay too, that's good. But do you see? The law is utterly impersonal. The seasons and cycles and changes of life, this is the, the turning of the wheel. And we take it personally as if somehow the dark is contending against us. But it cannot be. It cannot be. The dark cannot be contending against us. It can only be the process of outpicturing. This law of cause and effect is the process of demonstration of creation. The Tao Te Ching says it this way. The Tao gives birth to the one, one gives birth to two, two gives birth to three, three gives birth to 10,000 beings. The Tao, the way, the infinite unmanifested reality gives birth to one, the oneness, the wholeness, the impulse of creation itself. The one gives birth to two, this is the, the impulse of creation, which gives birth to two. As above, so below. This two gives birth to three. The law of cause and effect. And this creative process gives birth to the 10,000 beings. This is an image, Oma Takweas, all my relations from a beautiful beautiful Native American artist. The one gives birth to the two, or the, the unmanifest gives birth to the one, the impulse of love, which gives birth to the two, which is the, the constant experience of life in its seasons and cycles. The law of cause and effect is birthed out of that, the three, and from that comes all creation. And so you see this, this apparent duality 
is actually a dual unity, as above, so below, as in consciousness, so in reality. As the light is brought forward, so the darkness simply dissipates. Do you see? One of the things that we, yeah, we have to recognize is that, is that when we are living and understanding that, that this apparent duality is the experience of the external and the essential reality is the internal presence, you see, when it is moving out into the world, it's either all there or it's not. What do we call the absence of light? We call it dark, don't we? It's the absence of light. What do we call the absence of heat? Cold. There is actually no force for cold in the universe. There's only the absence of heat. So when we are experiencing this reality of life, these circles and cycles and seasons, you see this is the life that is unfolding around us, as us, through us, on our human experience. And there is the spiritual reality, which is the essential nature of who we are. And the more that we bring that present, do you see, then we, there is more light. And the darkness doesn't fight back. This beautiful phrase from John, and the light shineth in darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. Because there is no force for darkness, it is simply the absence of light. Ernest Holmes loves this quote, and so he wrote this. Thought which is built upon a realization of the divine presence has the power to neutralize negative thought, to erase it just as light has the power to overcome darkness. Not by combating darkness, but by being exactly what it is, light. And the light shineth in the darkness, and the darkness comprehended it not. He goes on to say, how can we feel insecure if we have faith in God? The answer is simple enough. We cannot. As faith in life is restored, the sense of insecurity withers and dies. Why? Because it isn't a thing of itself. It is the unconscious feeling of insecurity that produces most of our anxieties, those vague feelings that things are not right, that make the future look dark and gloomy and rob the present of its happiness. Anxiety disappears as faith enters, just as light dissipates darkness. And so what's so amazing is that ultimately this is the message of the winter solstice. Do you see, no matter how dark it is, the light returns, always, without fail, without question. All that is required is our faith. And our alignment with that light, instead of believing only in this wheel of duality, in this constantly changing set of seasons, we can allow this then to move because we stand knowing who we are, how the world works, how the universe operates, where the presence is of God resides, and what the truth, the spiritual truth, is. This quote is often, um, um, what do I want to say, attributed to Eleanor Roosevelt. It actually comes from Confucius. It is better to light one small candle than to curse the darkness. 
It is better to light one small candle than to curse the darkness. Ernest Holmes also loved this quote. So I'm going to close with this, and I just invite you to close your eyes and listen. Yes, it is better to light one candle than it is to curse the darkness. The darkness in our life is dissolved when we light the candle of understanding, the candle of forgiveness, the candle of love and truth. Darkness has no power over light, but light does have power over darkness. Hate has no power over love, but love can dissipate hate. Fear cannot destroy faith, but faith can annihilate fear. Let us therefore light the candle of love, human kindness, forgiveness, and understanding in our own soul and let it shine brightly. Let us not peer into the darkness, troubled and concerned, because it is so foreboding and unknown. Rather, let us remain steadfast in the radiance of that spiritual light of truth within ourselves within all creation. Let us stand guard so that the winds of malice, cross purposes, ignorance, or misunderstanding will not blow out the light. Let us so live that each day that the light from our candle of spiritual truth will forever be clear forever be seen not only by ourselves but by all with whom we come into contact so this holiday season we simply light our small candle that we may not curse the darkness but simply allow our life to shine as the presence of the divine that it is. And so it is.